Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Rumor Flies. I am Ryan. And I'm Josh. And we're here with Greg from InDeath Media again. Hello. Again. Oh God. Again. <laughs> So today we're going to be covering something very, very, very pertinent to rumors and myths, and that is going to be remedies. Remedies. Little homemade remedies. First off, before we get to any of those, we're going to go ahead and mention the plugs that we usually do per episode, one for Dark Myths, and then we got a a local one too today. So Josh, you want to start off? Yeah, I'll start us off, and I'm going to do the one with Dark Myths. Uh, The one I'm talking about is Razor Cut which is part of the Razor Wire After Civilization series. Now, Razor Cut is an ebook and it's a podcast. So the ebook has been released, it's also an audiobook, and the podcast will come out weekly. So if you want to get it all at once, go get the ebook or just wait and every week you'll get part from the podcast. If you can listen to it, it's probably in that format. He's going to be coming out with an album for it too. Yes. So Razor Wire is a spoken word post-apocalyptic dystopian adventure. The story takes place 100 years after a mysterious catastrophe following the survivors who abandoned into tribes to rebuild civilization from scratch. Now, Troy Hallowell, as he describes it, he's the author of all of this. He says, basically, the story is what you would get if you crossed Clint Eastwood with The Hunger Games and Orson Scott Card wrote it. So it sounds like something right up my alley because I like Clint Eastwood, Hunger Games, and Orson Scott Card. So, well, I'll volunteer myself as tribute. <laughs> Clint, yeah, Clint in Eastwood, Cat and his Eastwood. So, uh, yeah, so I think it's definitely something to go check out. Uh, you can find it on darkmyths.org, or we'll be leaving links in the show notes for this and what Greg's po- uh, going to be plugging, Nolan Nerdcast. So, yeah, so Nolan Nerdcast. You sounded so annoyed by it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, this one that Greg's. Fine. Well, it's just when Greg talks, I'm like. Ah, here you go, Greg. That's most people's reaction. <laughs> anyway, Greg, I'll give you the microphone now. Let's go. So Nola Nerdcast is um, a New Orleans-based podcast. Uh, that's the Nola, obviously. They focus mostly on nerds and nerd culture. Uh, it's two guys, Chris and Matt. I've known them for quite a while. Uh, we've done, I've filmed some of their content before. I've recorded a handful of episodes. But they're pretty much, uh, they do their own thing and uh, record all in-house and have their friends on all the time. And they cover basically all different aspects of nerddom and are really good about dividing the content up accordingly. So we'll have episodes all about the latest comic releases, about the games launched at E3, any of the major movies coming out. And uh, they're just basically talk about what's coming out, talk about reactions to it, and then just their own personal takes on it. They're really good about consuming a lot of the media they're talking about. So it's a really fun podcast. Definitely check them out. It's a uh, nolanerdcast.com n-o-l-a for nola by the way so nolanerdcast.com facebook.com slash nolanerdcast that seems to be kind of their two main avenues they're on youtube and a lot of other platforms as well yeah, and they're one of our members of the uh, new orleans podcasting group that we they graciously decided to join i mean we're trying to get that started but if any other podcasters out there from new orleans that want to join in let us know well nolan nerdcast i just want to say they release weekly right yeah they 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 put out about three or four they're, they're pretty consistent weekly but they generally will not put out less than three a month or so and um they've been doing it for quite a few years now they've been really diligent and at it and they're just really passionate guys so highly recommend them Nice. Check them out. Yeah, go check them out. So, and the last thing we're going to do before we get into the episode. Before that. Well, is we're going to get into some housekeeping. Housekeeping, too. Well, But what? I just thought of something. Oh, God, what? A fistful of districts. <sighs> I'm going to punch you in the f***ing mouth. Okay. <laughs> That's all I want to get out. It's fine. The Hunger Games. <laughs> I, I got it. I totally got it. <laughs> so, like a fistful of dollars? Yeah, no, I, I got it. Yeah, for a few districts more. Yeah, we can go all day with this. I got and, it. Any more Kone is going to do it? Featuring Lenny Kravitz. Well, wait, oh, God. What is it? The good, the bad, and the what? Ugly. Uh, obviously. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay. So the bit of housekeeping we're going to do. Now, so I'm going to call a penalty shot on myself, which I will gladly take tonight, later on after the podcast. <laughs> um, when I was talking about, when well, when Ryan was talking about the death episode, when he was talking about dropping a penny off of a tall building, he said they rounded it into 10 meters, 10 meters per second squared. And I said, yes, it's 9.81 technically meters per second squared. And then I said, or 32.2 feet per second. It's 32.2 feet per second squared. Now, if you've ever taken a math, cl- math class, those exponents, they make all the difference in the world. So I'm just going to be fair. I know it's something simple, but... 32.2 feet per second squared. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about and is something that I want to make sure, I don't know if we maybe muddied the water, if we didn't explain it well enough, but when we were talking about terminal velocity, we were talking about acceleration. Everything has the same acceleration when dropped on Earth. It's 
always 9.81 meters per second squared. Actually, it's negative 9.81 meters per second squared. But anyway, um, if it's going other, if it's going in the other direction, so it's but it's always 9.81 or negative 9.81 meters per second squared. The that is a, the constant acceleration of any object dropped from anything, whether it's an egg, a watermelon, atomic bomb, whatever. What I wanted to make sure we cleared up was terminal velocity. That is in meters per second. So acceleration in meters per second squared, terminal velocity is in meters per second. And terminal velocity is what changes according to the object that you drop. So whether you drop a penny or whether you drop, you know, something similar in size but much more dense, they're going to have different terminal velocities. And that is the speed at which basically wind resistance stops function, you know, stops going against it and it's its maximum speed. So I just wanted to clear the air with that up in case, you know, anybody was really listening and I just want to do my due diligence. And I have two as well because apparently during the death episode we had a big post death shitting of the bed. So uh here are my two. Oh you. I see what you did yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my two are I was talking about nails and hair growing out, and Josh asked what they're made of, and I very pridefully and assuredly said chitin, and I was f***ing wrong. And me, like a shithead, believed him. It's keratin. Yes. So that's number one, and number two, let's see, what was it, what was it, what was it? Do you remember what number two was? Poop? No, it wasn't about poop. <laughs> it was, that's the only one I remember was the keratin. It was some. Oh, that's right. The metric system. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the imperial system. That's right. So I said that Libya uses the imperial system. It's actually Liberia. Greg, please look that up for me. No, no. It's, I, I was mad at myself for not catching that. It, it, it's, um, I'm, I'll, it's Liberia. I'm okay. 99%. I'll check to be safe. But. All right. Now that we've got all that taken care of, last thing before we start with any topics, this is an episode about remedies, stuff that you can subject to your own body. Please do not take this as any medical advice whatsoever. This is a bunch of, I guess you could call them old wives' tales, but this is nothing that you should do just because even if we say that it's okay to do it or it won't harm you or anything like that, don't take it from us. Look up your own research, check our show notes if you want, and then make your own decision, but we are not telling you to do any of this for any reason possible. Yeah, and don't also let... Also Myanmar. <laughs> yeah, don't... Yes, don't let uh you know three f***ing idiots with a podcast tell you what specific things to do to help your body. We're not Dr. Oz. No. <laughs> oh, we're more... Yeah. <laughs> well, it, we're kind of doing the same thing as Dr. Beep, Oz beep, right beep. now. The meter's just going up, going uh, up. So I guess with all that being said, I'll, uh, I'll jump into it right here. Now, the first topic that I'm going to talk about is using lemon juice to dye your hair. Now, the thing about that... Well, before we start all that, we're actually going to have some... Video supplemental material supplied by Ryan. Yes, I am once again donating my body to podcasting. So To podcasting science. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I do not know anything about what Josh researched with this. I have my own preconceived ideas of it. And either way, I'm going to be calling bullshit on whatever he says. And I'm going to try to dye my hair with lemon juice. Well, so... You, well, you're going to be going outside as well. So you're going to do lemon juice plus the sun added to it. There's a difference. Yes. So... Okay, from the guy who has not done the research, the myth that I've heard is you generally take lemon juice, put it in your hair, soak it liberally, and then afterwards you go into the sun for about two to four hours, and afterwards you will have brighter hair after that. Okay, we'll, we'll use that as a jumping off point. Um, I'm going to get into it, but so there's a lot of problems I ran into and I know Ryan did as well. So researching these topics as a whole, apparently not a lot of people decided to do a lot of scientific research into remedies. Oh, dude, it sucked. Yes, it was fucking terrible. And for the record, all these remedies that we're doing are more related to like food based remedies. Yes, which you would think there would be more science behind it, but there really isn't any. Yeah. Um, now, for me personally, when I was looking into the specific myth about the lemon juice, the amount of Pinterest things that i found is absurd pinterest cosmopolitan daily health whatever good housekeeping i don't give a shit all of them had the same suggestions of using lemon lemon juice to dye your hair and it drove me insane because i wanted the science behind it so i had but why no why just do exactly which is part of the danger with the society and but i won't go into that little tangent right now but i took a very different approach to this i basically attacked it from 
the like different pieces from the science aspect and then tried to piece them together. So maybe I can, well, I could probably pass organic chemistry at this point with the amount of research that I did. So were you just trying to put together Legos and connects? <laughs> such a dick i was i was using play-doh and lego pieces and trying to put them together to make a charizard but it didn't work play-doh's the duct tape of the toy world so it's it's okay (laughs) it's a great point Ryan. (laughs) that is a great observation man okay so the long story short is ryan you'll be happy to hear or unhappy depending on how you feel about it yes you can use lemon juice to dye your hair bullshit you can it's true so your hair is made up of keratin which ryan wrongly suggested because it also makes up you know your nails and your skin in addition to your hair so don't listen to ryan with whatever bullshit that he said last episode so yes hair is made of keratin now the natural color of your hair depends on the amount of two particular proteins one is eumelanin and the other one is pheomelanin eumelanin is what makes your hair dark so if you have Dark hair, uh, like brown hair, black hair, really dark natured. That is because there's a predominant amount of eumelanin. Now, if you have blonde hair or red hair or ginger hair, as a lot of places described it, uh, that is pheomelanin. So that's what makes each one a certain color. And the absence of both of them is what gives you white or gray hair. And then there's melania, which gives you the preconceived notion that you should run for president. Oh, God, Ryan. You're such a dick. So... Jumping into the science aspect of this. Now, I'm going to do my best to get into the science, you know, really scientifically, but I'm going to definitely put this in terms of Uncle Rusty because that's how I learn a lot better. Now, if you remember back to grade school, the pH scale, right? I think everybody can remember that. Mm -hmm. You have one to 14. One is your acids. 14, you know, closer to 14 is your bases. Seven is neutral, like water. Okay. Citric acid, which is lemon juice, has a pH of 2.2. So obviously, it's very, very acidic. Okay. We're all on board with that, okay? Now, the reason why lemon juice dyes your hair is because it deposits those acidic dyes onto the hair molecules themselves. And by doing that, it changes the pigmentation of your hair. So just by putting lemon juice on your hair, it's going to dye it a lighter color. Now, obviously, the more you put on there is the more acidity you're adding to it, which means that it's going to become lighter. Now, I'm not saying you're going to become like platinum blonde, but it, lemon juice is only a temporarily temporary fix. So there's only so much, you know, coloration it's going to give you. But so the next question is, what happens with the sunlight? Now, if you well, oh, the other thing I want to say is like much like with the lemon juice, it's since it's very acidic. It, when you it washes out very easily so shampoo actually i don't know if you knew this ryan the ph level of shampoos runs anywhere between five and seven ph no i didn't know that yes. I never thought about so it. so it's like very neutral i didn't either um so that's why it washes out so when you put lemon juice in there basically i hope you enjoy it for the video supplement because it's not going to last very long okay now now the next question is adding sunlight to it what exactly does that do and i thought it was interesting so i kind of took it on a two-pronged approach and i thought it was worth mentioning uv rays affecting your hair but also affecting your skin because they're made by the same substance so i kind of went down both avenues a little bit so melanin is what protects your skin and your hair from the uv rays except there's two very different reactions it has in your hair and on your skin if you remember your hair is dead it's all dead molecules Mm -hmm. so when the melanin dies it actually naturally turns that blonde color so so it can't repair itself either afterwards not until new hair grows correct So by adding lemon juice to it and, you know, adding sunlight, you're adding lemon juice to dead hair cells and which makes it lighter. So you're just making your hair lighter all over the place. Now, when it comes to your skin, though, your skin's not dead. It's alive. It it actually breathes. And when you have sunlight exposed to it, the UV rays, it produces more melanin to protect you. And that's what actually makes it makes your skin darker. Okay. So I, I just thought that was really interesting how, you know, it does the same thing, but two very different, you know, approaches and results. Oh, no. A lot of things get recycled in the body and used for multiple purposes. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your skin, that's why it gets darker is because your body makes more melanin and to protect itself, it makes it darker to protect from the UV light. So all encompassing in a nutshell. Yes, lemon juice makes your hair lighter when added to it. UV light also makes your hair lighter. Doing both of them will make your hair lighter. And make sure you put on some sunscreen because it 
kills the melanin in your skin cells if okay. exposed to sunlight. So we'll see how I look after this. Yeah, well, Slim Shady over here. Come on. Oh, God. <laughs> that about wraps up all that. All right. So the next one is for the ladies. That's it. I'm talking about UTIs. Oh, God. <laughs> Guys can't get UTIs? No, they can. Okay. But it's much more Sexist. common for women. And I'm about to tell you why. So what we're going to be talking about is the fact that cranberry juice cures urinary tract infections. Uh, There's the famous line from The Departed, huh? What do you want to drink? Cranberry juice? Why are you on your period? He gets in a fight afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's one of the best movies of all time. Oh, just saying. Leo. Yeah. It's great, greatest actor of all time. So uh, We can talk about that. <laughs> Sorry. He's, he's, he's good at yelling. He's good at everything. I don't know. So... UTIs, or urinary tract infections, are mainly caused by bacteria, particularly E. coli, that's the predominant one that causes this, traveling through the urethra into the urinary tract. And the reason why women catch UTIs much more frequently than men is because they have shorter urethras, unless, uh, you know, we're going to there's so much genitalia talk here, I, I, I'm really stepping on eggshells the first time we've had to do this stuff, and it, <laughs> Uh, I mean, okay. I'll just, I'll keep my mouth shut. I'm trying to imagine a situation of one with a really wrong, long urethra, but at this point... <laughs> it's called a penis, right? Hey, Greg, you were looking up boobs in the death episode. No, it was the drugs episode. Yeah. Why was... don't you look up long urethra and women afterwards? <laughs> go ahead. Just do it. That's what the incognito mode's for. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, how do we fix these? Well, the key ingredient in cranberries is something called A-type proanthocyanidins. Wow, I got through that in one take. I was going to say, that was really good. Yes, and they are shortened to PACs, which is exactly what I'm going to call them from now on. <laughs> don't, don't, don't roll the dice more than once, Ryan. So, PACs are known to prevent bacteria from adhering to the bladder wall. So, generally, when these things get into your urethra, they get up to the urinary tract, which includes the uh, bladder. And they need to bind to something and just kind of like, you know, start camping there and just wear out their welcome for a while. I hate campers. Uh, so the idea of it is that I just hate camping in general. Really? No, it, camping sucks. You're paying to get inconvenienced most of the time. Uh, I mean, yeah, but it's like, you know, Oregon Trail, our ancestors dying of dysentery. You know, I get the whole thing of like being, you know, closer to nature and all that stuff. But it's just like most of the time. People bring like a Coleman grill or and like an RV and all that stuff, and just like, hey, but that's not real camping. Real camping is like pitching a tent. <laughs> I know you're gonna do that. <laughs> Both of you can go f yourself, but like pitching a tent, making you know, putting rocks around the fire, building it, and you know, ideally, you would like go catch your own food, like fish and whatnot. And yeah, that'd be cool. I'd be cool to camping where you build your own bow and just catch rabbits and snap their necks and then skin them like a sock afterwards, but you know. <laughs> Ryan, you, you might you have some issues, my friend. It's not issues or anything. It's just most of the time, camping is just like living at your house, but you have a harder time finding a good place to shit or not having it just settle there afterwards. Like, I just don't get it. Okay. I mean, I can kind of see it. All right. Keep going. Okay. Getting back on track. So, PACs, like, kind of unsticky the walls of the bladder and stop bacteria from adhering to it and causing infection. However, yes, cranberries do contain these, but it is generally believed that there is not enough PACs in store-bought cranberry juice to have much of an effect on preventing a UTI. Huh, okay. Now, there are concentrated, like, extract pills that you can find in drugstores, like cranberry extract, that I I've seen them before, and I actually just wanted to, like, eat a few just to see if they tasted like cranberries afterwards. <laughs> but these have enough to actually have an effect. After many studies have been done, they found out that generally juice is not concentrated enough to really prevent it unless you're drinking a whole lot. But one of those cranberry pills has the equivalent of, I want to say right here, 16 ounces of cranberry juice. Wow. So it's much easier to digest. You know, you don't have to like take in all that sugar from the cranberry juice. And you don't become bloated after drinking all of yes, it. Yes, and it's much easier to like take in the morning than making sure to go out your way to have cranberry juice. It's probably cheaper too. Yeah, that's right. So that's pretty much that, but the recent studies that have looked up anything about these PACs helping, 
is that they've shown that cranberry may mildly help, if at all, but it definitely will not harm you. So really, there's no losing to taking this. Maybe it'll hit your wallet a tiny bit if you're buying like really high-grade cranberry juice extract pills or something like that. I don't get why you would. But anyway, so ladies, (laughs) if you want to prevent a UTI... Go ahead and take yourself some cranberry extract. It might not do anything, but then it might do something. So the actual cranberry juice, though, doesn't really do anything for him. Yes and no. It could help. It won't hurt you. Yeah, it won't hurt you, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help. Results inconclusive is what I'm going to say on this one. And that's the problem with this is that a lot of these remedies that we're looking at, for some reason, everybody just for however many hundreds of years just been like, yeah, we're just not going to ask about it. We like not finding out that this is complete bullshit, so... Yeah, I found that's a lot of problem with these remedies. Yes, I can yeah. I can agree with that. So anything else you need to add to that? No, that's it. So let's uh, move on to you. Okay, and the next one that I'm going to get into, which I find really interesting, is I've heard this a million times, is that if you get sprayed by a skunk, you bathe in tomato juice, and it will completely neutralize the, the smell of the skunk. Let's address the first issue. How much tomato juice do you need to <laughs> bathe in? Because Jesus Christ, like I was, every time I hear that, I'm just like, where do you get that much? Well, yeah. Um, well, so I looked into like the origin of this myth, which I mean, you know, spoiler alert, couldn't find anything. The earliest, like really well-known instance that I found was actually in an episode of the Partridge family. In the 70s. Really? Yes. So there was an episode of the Partridge family where the family was going to perform at like some hospital and then they get sprayed by a skunk and they're freaking out. And then so they all bathe in tomato juice and it fixes it. But then the dog's a motherfucker and brings the skunk back in and they get sprayed a second time. And then they all just end up performing from like an enclosed room so nobody smells them. And everybody's honky dory and roll credits. Well, they shouldn't have performed at the hospital in the first place. Those are the fans that are never going to keep buying their albums. You're such a piece of shit, right? <laughs> You're not wrong, but um, yeah, but that was like the big instance. Like, and I think that's where a lot of this myth comes from. But uh, and our favorite way to dispel a rumor, it is bullshit. Okay. So what actually causes, you know, after you bathe in tomato juice and you think the smell goes away, it's actually something called olfactory fatigue. And basically what that is, why are you laughing? <laughs> no, I just, I, I, I know exactly what you're about to say, but it's just funny to think of it that way. Well, yeah. Where your nose just like, I'm fucking done. I'm <laughs> done smelling anything. Well, I, so for those of you who don't know what olfactory fatigue is, it's where your nose becomes accustomed to a smell and basically just neutralizes it and doesn't worry about it. And it picks up on the tomato juice and is like, ooh, that smells great. So if I get sprayed by a skunk... The bathe, bathe, Jesus, I don't know what that was, bathed in a whole tub of tomato juice, and then five minutes later, Ryan came up to me, you would not smell anything besides the skunk, really, because that's what your nose is privy to automatically. Oh, Jesus. So your your nose is being an asshole once again. I mean, we were talking about, like, the brain, the left brain being the liar in our brain episode, yeah. but now the nose just be like... It. I'm tired of everything. Yeah, sure. Just I'm going to make it smell like anything you want me to. Just I don't care. It tricks your brain. That's exactly what it does. It 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 tricks all your senses into thinking that there's no problem here. It's kind of like that little voice in your head when like you rip a hole in your pants and it's like, oh, nobody's going to notice. You just keep plowing through your day, buddy. Exactly. Just keep going and no one will <laughs> fucking notice. Meanwhile, everybody like sees your dong hanging out or whatever. Yeah. Ever had that happen to you? No, not at all. No? Okay. I did pee my pants in kindergarten and... And my teacher was the biggest bitch about it because she called me out in front of everybody after your line up after recess. And she looked at me and I was like, I'm about midway through the line of like kids, you know. And she was like, Ryan, do you have an axe? I was like, no, it was orange juice. <laughs> and she was like, are you sure? I was like, no, it was orange juice. So we kept going. And I just went through the rest of the day with my, my pants wet. Well, so, I mean, I didn't want to own up to that afterwards. I, uh... I I had a friend that recently peed his pants in a very social setting and he was drunk out of his mind and he peed his pants because and but here's the thing. It's not like he was just like, oops, there it goes. He was so obliterated. He walked into the bathroom, walked up to the urinal, just didn't unbuckle his pants and pissed himself. (laughs) (laughs) And then just looked at him and was like, ah, shit. But just plowed through the night like a trooper. Right place, right time, wrong conditions. Exactly. <laughs> at least it wasn't poop. There it is. 
<laughs> oh god. But so pretty much essentially it doesn't have to be tomato juice. You could just like make a giant bowl of tricks inside your bathtub and then just yeah, bathe in I, that afterwards. In theory, yes, but I'm I'm gonna get more into that in a minute. So the main component of skunk spray is thiols, which is basically another name for sulfur based compounds. Am I on the right track, Ryan? You're looking at me. Uh, I actually cannot back that one up. Nice. I got something Ryan can't do. So thiols is actually a combination of thion, which is another name for sulfur, and alcohol. So when those two have a baby, you get thiol. Thion, alcohol, thiol. So it's like egg fermented beer. I'm glad you brought that up because I was just going to say, if you've ever been anywhere and you've drank the water and it has that like eggy taste to it, that is the sulfur in the water. And that's because our nose and our taste buds and everything, we can detect sulfur in parts per billion. That's actually very impressive. Yes. Uh, So one of the things I used to deal with was GCMS. That's a gas chromatograph mass mass spectrometer. And essentially what it is, is a, this isn't exactly the most scientific terms, but it's a. It's okay. We're all about Uncle Rusty terms around here. It's a robotic tongue and nose. It's like a sense and smell system. Cool. It can detect compounds judging by, well, their mass. It's a completely different type of deal, but it's analogous to a tongue or a nose. And I've always wanted to say that we actually have very good GCMSs in our mouth and our nose because we can detect things at such small amounts. I mean, that's how flavor works. Yeah. Uh, The flavors for peach and almond and a few other different things i want to say butter as well butter are generally based around some of the same compounds and most of the time in the flavor industry all they do is they just vary the amount of that certain flavor compound by parts per million or parts per billion depending on what they're making and that can make it taste between peach and coconut nice that's really interesting same thing just the amount you add changes it well that's like so sulfur we can Detect in parts per billion, exactly. which is actually why, I don't know if y'all knew this, that's why they add sulfur to gas to gas pipes. It doesn't hurt anything, but it allows us to detect the gas leaks. Taste the meat, not the heat. Yes, I've never heard that. But no, that that's from King of the Hill. Oh, I don't know if that was like your personal slogan. For no, me. propane is scentless usually, but they actually add sulfur to the gas so yeah, that so you, can you can detect it. Oh, that's so same thing, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's why they do it. Now... What actually works for a skunk spray, I actually have the, the formula here. It's like one quart hydrogen peroxide, a fourth cup of baking soda, and a teaspoon of soap. But I thought it was really interesting. The reason I, I wrote what it actually was was because, like, in terms of science, you're oxidizing the thiols into sulfonic acid, mm-hmm. which for dumb people like me, which means you're transforming the smell of something very odorous into something your nose can't detect. And in Uncle Rusty terms, it's like using laundry detergent. It just washes it clean. Yeah, it's neutralization. Yeah, it, that's all it basically does. Yeah. So tomato juice doesn't do anything. There's You need something much more you know, acidic like uh, using um, hydrogen peroxide and baking soda. That'll do m- much more, a you know, much better job than tomato juice will because olfactory fatigue will set in and make you look like an idiot and smell bad. Really? That's it. Well, that was cool. Yeah, yeah. I like it. So you ready for my fun one? Yes. Because y- you Boy, ha- am I ever. I- <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, am I. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to talk about carrots and eyes. So, Josh, are you aware of this, just for me saying those two words? Yeah. Um, there's that famous movie, historical documentary, Shoot 'Em Up with Clive Owen. My, my just favorite movie. That. I was literally just about to say. <laughs> it's actually, honest to God. I about making a comment or not. One of my favorite action movies of all time. Is it ridiculous? Yes. But is it fun? Absolutely. He basically just goes around shooting everyone, but he keeps eating carrots the whole time because it makes his eyesight better. So it's John Wick with carrots? Uh, John Wick was like more like real. I mean, Shoot 'Em Up was absurd. Well, you know the movie's a giant... It's supposed to be kind of like a giant Elmer Fudd Bugs Bunny thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that too. But mm-hmm. yeah, so I know that in theory, if you eat more carrots, you will have better eyesight. Right. So the earliest origin I could find about this was that the British Air Force during World War II... Oh, I knew this. Oh, you were going to mention it? Yes, I was. Well, I'll go ahead and take care of it anyway. Oh, you. So the British Air Force during World War II claimed that their nighttime prowess against the German Air Force was that they ate carrots, which promoted better eyesight. Now, there's a few different theories behind this. 
A lot of people believe that it was the big carrots that were uh, actually just trying to promote this so that people would buy more carrots. It was big. Great marketing. Big agriculture. That's yeah, great marketing. <laughs> exactly. Others believe that it was actually a cover up for their newly implemented radar technology. Oh, okay. Both of these are kind of not true because, well, it's pretty easy to detect. I'm not going to go into it, but it's pretty easy to, that the Germans knew that there was radar systems already, and the British knew it too. They both knew that they were using radar systems. Yeah, it wasn't a secret in World War II. Yeah. So I've, I've been listening to a lot of Can Darlin. Uh, that doesn't yes no, it counts you, yes it does yes it does <laughs> that's my workaround um and yeah that was one of the big like things he talks about is the, the invention of radar and how, the effect on the war yeah but i guess whatever the answer is the idea was that carrots improved night vision and that's why they were better against german pilots is because they had better night vision so does this actually do what it says the short answer is yes Nice. Yes. So we'll go ahead and get into the sciencey part of it, which this is where I'm going to go on a tangent. And if you've heard me do projecting with Greg, I've already talked a little bit about something at the end of this. And it's something that I actually care a lot about. I, I, I have no idea what you're about to say, but I know it involves GMOs. Yes, it <laughs> totally does. It totally does. So do carrots actually improve night vision? Yes, because of a compound called beta carotene, which is a pigment in many foods which is used to create vitamin A. Vitamin A is important for processing light coming into the eye during low light conditions. Without it, we will pretty much not be able to, we'll be bumping into everything. And I, number one, we have to have some sort of light source in the first place to see anything. But the amount of vitamin A that you have in your system can help improve the amount of light that you need to actually process what's around you. Question. Okay. People like that are blind, do they have a... a, 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 um, a yeah, deficiency, thank you, of vitamin A? Some of them, yes. Actually, that's, once again, getting to it. Well, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to sh** on your... Without enough story. vitamin A, your cornea disappears. Oh. Yeah. So it's, that sucks. It's pretty damn important. Yeah. And, I mean, beta carotene, like, it's that stuff stains like a motherfucker. What, like, about, what about alpha carotene? You know, I couldn't answer you about alpha carotene because I never even thought about it. I know, but the beta carotene. <laughs> I don't know if that's a real thing. Way to stump me, Josh. <laughs> stump the Trump. The alpha carrot, the there's, alpha carotene that gets more all the girl carrots. There's actually an eye disorder that results from vitamin A deficiency called keratomalacia. Keratomalacia. Yeah, yeah, that's how I'd say it. Big in Africa. I'm getting to it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I finish? Can I finish? So, anyway. A 2005 randomized control study showed that beta-carotene-rich foods, including carrots, all stacked up to each other in improving eyesight. Uh, there's a lot of things that have beta-carotene in them. Tomatoes are included, pumpkin, uh, squash, uh, tons of different things. And even there was a Scrubs episode where a dude turned orange because He of, ate too many carrots. Yeah, he ate too many carrots or just orange things. That actually does happen. Yeah, I know that. You can turn orange from eating too many carrots. I love scrubs. That's a little aside right there. But you can turn orange from eating too many carrots, which is crazy to me. Yes, that's really weird. Why didn't Bugs Bunny turn, Bur 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 Bunny. Why didn't Bugs Bunny turn orange? Let's see how that matches up against your fucking melanin. <laughs> Cocksucker. So, anyway, the only thing that beat any of these beta-carotene rich foods... Wait, wait, you said carrots, not beets. Shut up. I Just know. shut up. <laughs> I got to get one terrible pun in per episode. I'm tired. I've had a long day and you're throwing in fucking beats and everything. You're going to the penitentiary. <laughs> That's good. I like that. So now that I can finally finish it, these foods that are rich in beta carotene were only beat by actual vitamin A supplements, the pure stuff, in significantly improving eyesight and particularly night vision. So... Yes, carrots can help to improve your eyesight. Once again, it's a whole issue of how much beta carotene is in carrots, but if you have a substantial amount in your weekly diet, then you probably will be maintaining at least good night vision. There are some genetic things that would stop you from having good eyesight in the first place, but it's one of those preventative things where it does not hurt to have it, and there's no real downside to it aside from potential orange skin, but you still have to eat like a, a lot ton yeah, of it. A so, lot. Yeah. And it seems to be more prevalent in kids than adults, for what, I'm, what I was just looking up. Yes. So what we're going to get to about this is the little aside that I want to do that really 
this is getting away from carrots. Go ahead, Josh. Well, yeah, I have a question. So vitamin A is what actually, is that what would give you the like orange tint? No. What would give you the orange tint? Beta carotene beta, beta carotene? Beta carotene is used to make vitamin A. Okay. Now, what about jaundice? Is that, is there any relation there between beta carotene and jaundice? I couldn't tell you, but I'm pretty sure Greg can soon. I literally was just like reading, about, and it was at, there was an article saying that it is not like jaundice because jaundice um, actually affects your eyes. Like, really? It affects the color of your eyes. Yeah, the actual white different. of your eyes turns yellow. They're saying the symptoms are different in that regard. Okay, cool. And also uh, the uh, beta carotene, it tends to be in your um, palms. palms and your soles of your feet. Nice. That's where mm-hmm. it tends to, the orange happens. It doesn't just like turn. Yeah, it's not like, orange. yeah. It tends to happen in your It's not like extremities. a bad spray tan. No, really. Yeah, it's not like a bad spray tan. Okay. That's, that, I not was that just... it can't, but that's where it typically shows that. And, you know, John has well, all kinds I'm, of other I'm, problems. I'm glad you looked that up because, I mean, it's like just me thinking out loud, which is a problem, but. Well, <laughs> however. There is another thing, before I get to my last aside, vitamin A is also known as tocopherols, and this is, uh, once again, I tested it back then, this is just going to become a recurring thing, so afterwards, this is a reason why you can actually not eat polar bear liver, because it's too high in vitamin A, and it become toxic to you. I didn't know people really wanted to eat polar bear liver. If you are in those areas where polar bears are, you will eat anything around you in general. But mm, that's true. Even the oh crap. I don't know what to say. I want to say Inuit's the right word now. I think it is. I think you're right. It's definitely not Eskimo. No, you cannot it's say not. Eskimo anymore. Uh, whatever the correct is. nomenclature. Yes. Sorry, I'm trying. You know what I'm saying if you're going to get offended by it. I'm sorry. PC police. Anyway, so <laughs> woo <Woo-woo! laughs> <laughs> uh, vitamin A can get very toxic and actually a few explorers have died from eating polar bear liver not surprised because it was heavy in vitamin A and it actually is very 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 lipophilic which means it loves to stay in fat uh, well they would listen to this episode rumor flies they wouldn't have had that problem now would they exactly that's their fault M- bitches subscribe <laughs> <laughs> click that subscribe button real quick but lastly one of my passion things is I'm going to talk about a certain GMO that they're actually trying to roll out in Africa soon. I think they've actually started to implement in a few different places, but it's called golden rice. And the big deal about golden rice is that there is a high vitamin A deficiency in a lot of African countries where they are struck by famine and a lot of kids are struck with early blindness and obviously affects their life for a while afterwards. I would imagine so. Yes. Yeah. And there's a few other ailments that come along with that too. But it's a big deal. It's a big epidemic. It's not like malaria levels bad, but it's bad. Well, since neither one of you will say it, you did go into like a lot of detail in the projecting episode with Greg about this. Yes. So if they want more information, go check out Greg's podcast projecting i know he's he's too humble to to say it but i know you you have like a like a 15 minute rant on it yeah so i'm just you know give a credit where credit is due here's the next 20 seconds that ends it golden rice implements beta carotene to be naturally grown into rice grains which gives them a yellow tint and that just incorporates beta carotene very easily into the people's diet without really changing it at all so and it can preserve their eyesight yes However, most people in the first world are too scared because they think the GMOs are going to harm you and they can't even tell you what GMO stands for. So, <laughs> God, I swear I wouldn't do this. <laughs> Moving on, Josh, go ahead. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to be talking about is bathing in oatmeal when you have chicken pox. Now, what I'm going to say, it, like, this is going to be really quick and really easy to talk about. Um, and actually this is, it's actually a nice little segue, Ryan, because you talk about beta carotene being really, vi- really rich in vitamin A. I'm going to talk about oatmeal being really rich in vitamin B. And that's what makes it great for chicken pox. <laughs> Greg, you realize you wrote something in the show notes and Ryan has his stuff printed I, I out, correct? I deleted it because <laughs> I forgot he had it printed. It didn't show up on my paper. <laughs> what a time to be alive. <laughs> Anybody listening, I've Greg-proofed myself because we have a Google Doc for most of our show notes when we're going over the topics, and Josh has a laptop, and Greg has a laptop, too, it's just so they, we well, can keep Well, you used to use an iPad. Yeah, I used to use an iPad, Apple but I've decided to kind of downgrade myself and just print up the document 
before we record. And Greg usually ends up f***ing up Josh by typing in something else. Like, he'll just put in Paco occasionally. Which he already did, and I just glossed oh, over dude, it. Oh, dude, it's Cinco de Paco. <laughs> <laughs> is it Paco de Mayo? Paco de Mayo. <laughs> Man, I have two beers and I'm done both of them. Anyway, so I- I've Greg proof myself. He can't exactly change the document live on site on my paper. Okay, so getting back into it. Bathing in oatmeal for chicken pox. Now, like I said, beta carotene, really rich in vitamin A. Oatmeal, fucking amazing for vitamin B. Like, fantastic. B12, B6. Well, so, well, there are 12 of them. Can you name them? No. <laughs> what? It's B1, B2 through 12. It's just B1, B2, B3. I'm talking, I'm not talking the scientific names. Well, there's no vitamin F, but there's a vitamin K. Well, yeah, well, that's potassium. So, anyway. <laughs> so oatmeal and chicken pox it's great richness in vitamin b like i said before that's it bye <laughs> Adios. So vitamin b is great for protecting your immune system and it's a great antioxidant which is really good for combating things like viruses i.e chicken pox so this i mean this is gonna be really quick but so while Vitamin B is great, and oat, well, oatmeal is great because of vitamin B. While it's great for your chicken pox, you also got to remember that chicken pox is a virus. So while it does help alleviate scratching, it doesn't take care of things like, you know, vomiting, nausea, uh, fever, headaches, things like that. It's not going to call it, like, just make all that. It's not a, like a one cure-all kind of thing. But it does help you not scratching, which to me, I can take being sick. I hate itching all over. Like, it just drives me insane. It is, like, top three things that I hate most in life. And one being Uncle Rusty, two being spiders, and three being sunburn. <laughs> in that order. I'm kidding, obviously. Spiders are number one. So, so your your worst day is you come back from a tubing trip and you're just sunburned as hell. You go home and Uncle Rusty's waiting at the door. Waiting just pet spider. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Josh, I want to show you my tarantula. <laughs> I would nope the fuck out of there on that one. So, um, just real quick, and you know, just like I said, it's real quick. Um, that's why it's really great for you to do it. There's really no, you know, that's like the science behind it, and there's really nothing else I can add to it other than just. And I know we were not like suggesting these remedies, but B12, you know, the the vitamin B is great for other things besides chicken pox, like poison ivy, uh, itchiness sunburn things like that so it, that's one thing that i will just throw out there that it's that it's not only used for for chicken pox it's used for a lot of other things as well see a lot of the things that i have picked up on here especially with the stuff that you're covering it's like where for instance you said what soap and some what else could co- uh, take care of the uh skunk skunk spray? Smell? it's baking soda and uh, hydrogen peroxide okay with a little bit of soap too and a teaspoon of soap yes okay there you go that's easy and said, nope, we're going to use a couple gallons of tomato juice. <laughs> so for this one... Do you think the really poor people use ketchup instead? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'm just saying. They go to Costco and just bathe in it. Nobody wants to bathe in hunts. <laughs> but By the way, if you had a speech impediment, that sentence would be very different. And I would have a very different reaction to it. going to be some editing <laughs> this episode. Who has some HC like crossover speech impediment? But anyway, so for going to that one, the one you just did, talcum powder. Th- that takes oh, care of reaching extremely easily. No, instead we're going to just get like a couple different just giant boxes of Quaker oatmeal and pour it in the bathtub again. Well, and so then- I will say this, like it, it was very common, you know, I mean, across the board for everybody that I know, like... With me, I mean, I know, Ryan, you're an only child, but, like, when my brother caught chicken pox, my mom was like, you go rub up against him and you get that shit. Like, you get chicken pox right now. It'll it'll help you out later on in life. Which is true because you build up an immunity to it, to the virus. And so it's not, like, something you can plan on. So if, like, it strikes at, like, 10 o'clock at night, you probably have oatmeal in your cupboard as opposed to, you know, something else. But enough oatmeal to cover your body for the itching? No, you you don't even need that much. Just rub your face in the bowl. Like, I remember, like, getting, like, three packs of oatmeal and just dumping it in the tub when I was a kid, and it did help. Hot water? Yeah, it was hot water. I mean, I didn't eat the oatmeal afterwards, but <laughs> I guess I could. I should have brought a spoon in there. 
No, baths are the grossest thing ever to me. It's making human soup of just like all the dirt on you. <laughs> no, soup. no, it's terrible. Like I think baths are super fucking gross. Like uh, everything that you're washing off it. of you just sits in there. Like with a shower, you know, it gets drained off of you and everything. I think if you're gonna take a bath, shower first and then plug your bathtub up after you waffle stomp it, and then <laughs> and then you can make the bath. See, to me, it, it that's way too much work. Like, give me a beer. I'm gonna get a sh- get in the shower, have my shower <laughs> beer, and I'll be I good to go. Don't. I just don't. Don't. Okay. I know where you're going with it. <laughs> all right so i guess i'll wrap it up and oh uh, well one thing i did well i guess with the wrap up one thing i did want to mention the book that i have why do men have nipples they mention the world war ii pilots and beta carotene about uh them having great eyesight really and you held that out for me huh I, I saw in the show notes that you had it so i didn't you know and i was gonna go on it but you're oh, like no, oh, look at me i'm ryan it, you know. i have it already so well, I, I thank you for your trust in me so, last one of the night is going to be, this was my white whale. I had a very hard time researching this one, found one article, and I could not pronounce a good third of the words in there, mainly because it was a lot of scientific names for stuff that isn't widely known about. Once again, apparently people just take this shit for granted and say, nope, we're not going to think about it, la 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 la, it works. And this one is ginger. And this one's really surprising to me. So, what I have heard is that ginger helps to alleviate motion sickness, nausea, and inflammation. Like it's I've never one, heard that. That's awesome. Though. It's one of those ancient Chinese secret things. Ask anybody with uh, like recurring motion sickness, they will say ginger and dramamine. Like those are their best friends. Yeah, I don't really have a problem with motion sickness, so yeah, I mean, I don't really have a reason to know that, but if that's true, that's awesome. Yeah. So ginger has been used for well over 2,000 years as a remedy for just about everything. It literally was kind of the, chi- the ancient Chinese secret. And it's, also, it's grown around the world. There are tons of different ginger plants. And there's not a whole lot of research behind it. But I'll give you what I do have. And the article that I have in the show notes is very extensive. And it pretty much wraps up just about all the research that was done on this. I mean, it's the NIH. It's pretty legit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So ginger has over 115 known key components that make it up or that are actually important that differ it from a bunch of other plants. I was going to say constituents, but pretty much key components that they have said are characteristic to ginger. Nice. So a lot of these active components come from something called oleoresins, which is short for, well, not short for, it's a translation. The rough translation is oily resins. Oh, man, they went on a limb there, huh? Right, exactly. Jesus. Oil resins. <laughs> <laughs> the two main components of interest are called gingerol, really creative right there. Yeah, right. And Josh, I'm going to let you try to pronounce this one because I I don't know. Shog AOL. <laughs> <laughs> It's Shogayol. It's S H O G A O L. That's how I. That's so, how I would have attempted to butcher. I'm gonna it. say Shogayol. That's fine. So we're gonna go with that. That one's hard. Jesus. So that's what she said. First, we're gonna go with the anti-inflammatory properties of it. Well, gingerol has been shown to actually have some anti-inflammatory properties for people with hip and knee problems, oh, and cool. it was shown in mice too. They aren't substantially good in anti-inflammatory properties, but there have been recorded ones. And that's the problem. We're going to see this like the entire way through all of these different topics. It is going to be contradicting studies. None of them necessarily bad, but a lot of them say that pretty much either it works or we didn't see anything happen. So yeah. it bounces back and forth. The results vary. Yes. It's just like the cranberry juice. It's kind I of a deal with. I was just going to say, yeah. It won't hurt you, but it also may not help you. So there's really no loss to taking it unless ginger is prohibitively expensive where you live. So anti-inflammatory, that's one mark for it. Probably helps it. Anti-nauseal, it actually does help this by breaking up a lot of gas bubbles in the stomach and dispersing them. That's how like gas X works and a whole bunch of other medicines. Ginger's it, most in of them? The time, no, ginger is not actually in them. Uh. It's, it's completely different uh, compounds. But they work by the same way as usually the time when you have like intestinal cramping or nausea, there are a lot of gases built up in your stomach and sometimes they are kind of like frothy or bubbly. And the way to alleviate this is to actually break up the bubbles in there. So it shows that gingerol actually is very good at doing this. So 
also very cool. But in terms of motion sickness, not much correlation has been made. There have been a few different times where they've seen, like, it's particularly seasickness. Seasickness is one of the ones where they weren't able to really see anything significant, I would say, for it. They tried it on sailors, the test. And really, when they did these placebo studies, all these studies that they did were done with placebos. We've talked about this before. Placebo is more or less a quote-unquote sugar pill. And in almost all these studies, yes, gingerol or uh, shagayol has beat out the placebo, but they'll go back a year later, and then there's no difference. So so the placebo worked in about 35% of those people? Oh, God. I actually did not get that number on there. I, I, That's I will check that actually. Out. Yeah, we'll check out the 35% number. Lastly, ginger is supposed to serve as an antioxidant. Number one, Greg, Josh, anyone want to tell me what antioxidant does? Because I see this used a lot in any commercials. Wait, 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 Everything has antioxidants in it and is good for you anti-aging. because it helps your immune system fights off things. And anti-aging. Anti-aging. Greg, that's the closest thing that I've heard to anybody giving an answer for antioxidants. Really? Yes. Well, I, it, well I, when I did my research for vitamin B and the oatmeal, it talks about how it helps combat things that attack the immune system. I guess cancer would be considered one of those things. Yeah, yeah. I hear a lot of cancer too. So I want to go into a little in service about what an antioxidant actually is and why you should care about them. Because it's just the new like it's the new spark word for anything that people are trying to sell is it's the new gluten. No, no, <laughs> gluten is the, the new villain. No, I know, I know. Gluten's like the new Undertaker. So, man, I used a wrestling reference, right? <laughs> I was gonna say that's the reference you go with. Not that I never even really watched it, but I mean, <laughs> is antioxidant like the Stone Cold Steve Austin, where it, like holds its hands up and gets two beers from the crowd? Yeah, kind of <laughs> kind of if beers were electrons yes uh, that is the greatest thing ever by the way so a little bit of an in-service about antioxidant is that what they do is they serve as a guard against free radicals now a free radical is any molecule that has a free electron i'm not going to get very sciencey into this that's where i'm going to stop there if something has a free electron, it has a tendency to interact with just about anything possible to get that little other electron filled because they usually like to go in pairs. So this includes anything in the body from any other molecules to cells, which can cause lots of damage if a free radical attaches to it and interacts. So these free radicals can come naturally just from the aging process or just from our diets or from pollutants, uh, carcinogenic things. Carcinogenic things are generally caused by free radicals. So these things are very good at just damaging also DNA and causing mutagenic cells, so causing cancer. Free radical sounds like a really bad terrorist organization. Radical! <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, these free radicals are very good at going into the body and f***ing it up. Like, they just are just like, they are the douches that walk into the bar and want to get laid by anything. In come antioxidants and are just the giant cock blocks afterwards. That's and, a great comparison, by the way. Yeah. Actually, no. What is it when, I guess they're the wingmen, antioxidants go in, and instead of the free radicals attacking the cells, the antioxidants just take the bullet for them and jump in front of them and kind of make sure the free radicals They do jump not, on a grenade. Yeah. They're the first things that, they inter, that the free radicals will interact with. Antioxidants take the bullet for the cells and take care of the free radicals before any damage can really be done. And this prevents uh, aging and it also prevents some carcinogenic activities that would lead to cancer turns out that gingerol is a very good antioxidant in the studies that they've done once again not a whole lot have been done but they have seen that there have been anti-mutagenic properties to gingerol so it's really weird for me to say this but ginger might actually be the shit like well, that's what I, when I was doing a lot of research and coming, like coming full circle here, just kind of wrap things up. When I went into oatmeal, like oats themselves, like that is a superfood, apparently. Like, so from what I've learned is that oats, ginger, and eggs are like three superfoods you should have in your diet every single day. And yet I cannot think of a meal that I can make with those three things in one. I will have to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a ginger, o- a ginger oat omelet. I guess the like the most like similar thing that I can think of is you take like ginger the like juice and you spray it on oats and you roll it up and you make like kind of like a candy like ginger flavored oatmeal it's and then still you eat fucking with the you don't even I'm finish. trying here I'm trying here oh boy so I guess that wraps it up but like 
this has been pretty hard for research for us today. Yeah, as far as research comes, I really tried my best to look into it. And then after my 12th page of finding Google results, like diverting to Pinterest, I just broke it up into pieces and tried to put those pieces together as best as I could. So it may not be the best answer, but it is the best that I can do. It's all right. And I feel confident in them that I think I did a good enough job. I appreciate your Play-Doh Lego method, so. Yeah, I... (laughs) Cock. <laughs> I I really did try my best, and I think that we really approached these things from like a really objective standpoint, and like really gave them a fair shot. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I really hate the fact that I am kind of not talking shit about herbal remedy. Like ginger, I was like, this is complete BS. This is not going to work. And yes, it may not have much of a correlation with motion sickness, but every other thing that it was listed on there. Kind of checks out. So the thing that you thought it would work for best actually doesn't, but it does so much more shit for other things. Yeah. So I'm not going to say I'm going to incorporate it in my diet and just start taking no. ginger pills every day. But this is one of those things where if my mom is like, Ryan, you know, Dr. Ross said this, I'm not going to be like, Ugh! like you probably still will be that because Dr. Ross said it. Yeah. The thing that I thought was much, most interesting is that I always heard like across the board from so many people is cranberry juice helps with UTIs. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in my life. And that's one of our shitty technical yeses. Uh, but see, I don't re- But see, I don't count that as a win. I count that as like, yeah, it doesn't hurt, but it doesn't necessarily help. There's better ways of going about it. Yeah. I mean, and like, this isn't some like long-winded like inspection of homeopathy or anything like that. It's just remedies that we've heard old wives tales that we've heard. Don't say the H word. Well, I think it needs to be pointed out in this situation, though. I mean, I know we have the caveat, but I think it's worth mentioning that, like, these are remedies that we heard, not like, you know. There's also an important distinction between this. There's holistic and homeopathic. Well, yeah, Holistic that's true. is that's what we're point. talking about. That's a great point. That's this is actually, yeah, you know, this is our holistics episode, I would say, yeah. if anything, because this is a lot of remedies where it's using natural things, like none, none of the stuff where you really have to go through any sort of uh, chemical process to really get the meat of it for it to work. Outside of lemon juice in your hair. Yeah. <laughs> Which I don't think there's going to be too many people complaining about dead cells. But, you know, you don't need lemon juice extract or some sort no, of thing no, like no, that. No, 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 no. So that's the difference between holistics and homeopathic medicine is that holistics is generally herbal stuff or alternative remedies. Homeopathy, I'm going to get into another episode because <laughs> there is an infinite string of curse words I could talk about that. And Dr. Roz is involved with it, too. <laughs> But I, I, I just I thought it was worth mentioning, though. I thought it I, I think but I, that's a great point. That is a great point that there's a difference between the two of them. So I thought it was worth mentioning. But I learned so much more. I probably learned more this episode than anything else that I've ever done. It wasn't by choice. It was for you guys, the listeners. And but you know what? I'm glad I did it because I feel like a smarter person by doing it. I've learned so much more. And I feel that I did a lot. I, I did my due diligence. And not that I don't feel like that before, but it's a good feeling to know like I put so much work into it and I was able to put all those pieces of the puzzle together to form that, you know, that thoughts and, and expressions that I had. No, solid, man. I'll pat you on the back once we're not recording anymore. You but... can pat me on the back anytime, Ryan. Well, I'm not going to reach over right now. I'm lazy. But I guess that about wraps it up, Josh. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything really, you know, anything else to add. Um, all right. I think we've got two last things on here then. So yes, yes, we yes, yes, yes. want to thank our most recent reviewer, Haiku Nick. Uh, you want me to read it? I have it pulled up. Sure. Why not? Okay. Thank you. Haiku Nick. It says, really fun and informative. These guys have fun tackling these topics and conveying them in a fun and informative manner. Can't wait to see what they cook up in the future. That was two funs and one pun afterwards. You can probably just listen to the food episode. Oh, yeah, I was thinking the same. Thing. Haiku Nick's a man of my heart. Yeah. Thank you, Haiku Nick. Thank you, buddy. And if we know you, then just, you know, hit us up. Um, oh, wait. You might know him. Maybe. I really hope we don't. That'd be really cool. That would be great. So, and lastly, one, one thing that we want to talk about is YouTube. So, we have a YouTube channel. Yep. And we really want subscribers for it because we cannot get a custom YouTube name until we have that amount. <laughs> We need to get 100 subscribers. So if you happen to have a YouTube account or just even a Gmail account, just... Yeah, they work the same. Hit that button. Watch our videos. We also have an archive on there now. Greg has put in a lot of work to make sure that all of our episodes, no matter where the cutoff is for whatever service you're using is for our episodes, they're all going to be on YouTube. 
And we also have supplemental content on there that you guys can check out that you won't find anywhere else. Yeah, by the time this episode is out, I may have much blonder hair. So. Um, and as always, guys, I want to mention, I know Ryan said that was the last thing. Right in. We are toying with doing things that you guys suggest. Um, we can always use that ideas. Um, we can always use feedback, all of it. Um, as always, go to iTunes, smash that five-star button if you don't mind. Josh, did you used to suck on coins? No, that was another friend of mine. Oh, so it was a mutual friend. Yes. Okay. Uh, our listener, Steven, yes. had a request about us looking about looking up about sucking on coins. Yes, we have a mutual friend that used to suck on coins when he was bored because he enjoyed it. I wish... Actually, that same friend was the one who peed his pants. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a correlation there okay um so yeah uh right in you know we are at rumor flies on twitter at rumor flies on instagram rumor flies podcast.com rumor flies at gmail.com facebook.com slash rumor flies i knew i was forgetting one of them That's and right. and Don't forget it youtube no well youtube yeah that's yeah fine. it's you can't they're, 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 it's just like a string i was gonna of say we're gonna numbers. have a link to our youtube channel on our on our website it's post on our google plus and uh and we'll actually put a link <laughs> to the youtube channel in the show notes as well if you just want to get there am i missing something yes what am i missing yes greg's favorite platform uh no i don't no one uses google plus look us up on google plus no one uses google yeah, plus. give us a plus one <laughs> <laughs> yeah give us a plus one on google plus but i think that about wraps it up so write in check out all that stuff out subscribe to youtube and thanks as, for listening as always. Yes, this has been Rumor Flies. I'm Ryan. I'm Josh. And I'm Greg. Thanks again, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Bye. This episode's closing song is Drift Apart by the New Orleans artist Aetherius.